All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our webinar this afternoon on Minecraft and assessing its um, capabilities and um, process in the classroom. My name's Karen Binns. I'm the current president of ICT Educators New South Wales, and I would like to welcome you all here. So thank you for being here. And I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Bron Stuckey to you. Um, awesome Bron Stuckey, that is. <laughs> and, um, and all things Minecraft, but more than that, she, she's a great person to get to know. And she's awesome at the gamification of learning in the classroom. And um, there's particular bio things I'm going to let her introduce herself. So for this afternoon for our webinar, we are going to um, put all our questions in the chat. And then Helen and I and Brian, who are sitting on the side here from the board, will ask Bron the questions or ask you to ask them. Uh, if you have something burning, you the question that you asked or you think we've missed your question. If you could use the reaction emojis and just raise your hand there, we'll, we'll see that. Um, there's approximately 93 people registered for this webinar, but we want to try and keep it as interactive as we can. And if you have questions at the end, um, we can stick around and ask, uh, answer those as well. So welcome and thank you, Bron, for being here. And um, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks, Karen. And um, hello, welcome everybody. Um, Hope you're enjoying school, last week of school, first week of holidays, wherever it is in your school term. Um, and I'm going to cover a lot of topics and I can change direction if we're not answering um, what you're interested in. Helen, um, Karen did send me the questions that had been recorded on registrations beforehand. So I had a little idea of what people were interested in. Um, so I'm very happy to change direction if there's a, a different way you might want to go. So I'm just going to pull up the presentation. And as I said, we can jump out of this at any time. Um, and let's go with that. Okay, so today we're going to look at assessing the value of Minecraft in the curriculum. And I'm going to tell you some of what I know of that, some of what I've seen from teachers, and some of the scepticism I share with some of you. And so I noticed from some of the questions, there were people who have concern about Minecraft's curricular value um, as opposed to its engagement value. And that's part of the research I'm currently doing. And so that's really to the core of what this session is about. So my background is that I'm, uh, I've worked with Minecraft and Minecraft Education Edition. So I've been with Minecraft before it was Education Edition, um, worked on a server called Massively Minecraft with the amazing Joe, Joe Kay and Dean Groom in New South Wales. And um, before that, I worked on a program called Quest Atlantis, which was an Indiana University and Arizona State University uh, virtual world, global virtual world for learning in middle school. So I've been working in immersive environments uh, for a long while. And of recent, I've worked for uh, Minecraft, uh, done some consulting to Minecraft corporate in Seattle to develop some resources and uh, case studies of education with Minecraft in Australia. So I've been looking at what other teachers are doing and I can share some of those examples. So, okay. So the line of inquiry that I'm talking about today, I share with um, Lisa Castaneda, who's the co-founder of Foundry 10 in the United States. And she and I got to talking about two years ago about immersive environments and some of the concerns we had about those environments and their use in schools. And both of us were finding very similar things. Um, and I'll, over the next couple of slides, I'll give you the sense of what that concern was. Um, so Lisa looks at VR, AR, uh, mixed reality, and I was particularly looking at virtual worlds. So Minecraft, OpenSim, Second Life, um, uh, those kinds of projects, Roblox, it could be Fortnite, uh, anything that is a virtual world uh, game space that's been used in the curriculum. 
So um, if you're interested in VR, I really would um, recommend you look at what the work being done by Foundry 10. Um, their work is in all, all in the United States, but they have been um, researching VR and its use in the curriculum. Um, and you know, expressing some of the same concerns, but also some of the same value that I'm going to explain today. So she and I are doing a joint project looking at how do we ensure these virtual worlds and virtual environments or immersive environments are actually working for in to assist in learning gains, that they're not just for engagement. So so these are some of the typical comments I see from teachers about using Minecraft in the classroom. So student engagement was absolutely out of this world. Students felt special and privileged to be part of a Minecraft trial. Um, student, when, with students who were not engaged with their learning, I think this is a great tool to encourage them to become active learners and so on. So you can read the rest of those, but you see teachers are using, when they describe it this way, they're using Minecraft as a hook um, in their classroom as a way to uh, engage students. And I don't want to reduce the importance of engagement, but the title of this, this session was, are we aiming for the ceiling or the floor? And I want you to think about that as I go on today on what might be the floor and what might be the ceiling if we're using immersive environments in our classroom. So these are typically the kinds of things I see from teachers. And these are great, you know, people are excited about engagement. It's perhaps um, a sad indictment of our classrooms that we're so enamored of engagement because engagement in learning should be what we expect to see every day. And obviously we're not reaching that for a, a good majority of our kids. So moving on, um, on reflection, when I was asking teachers to reflect on what they'd seen when they were working with Minecraft, I saw comments like students liked using Minecraft. Now I'm a huge, um, it gets my hackles up when I say teachers, hear teachers say they did something and the kids liked it. Oh, why did, how did it work out? Oh, we did X and the kids loved it. Well, you know, kids love picking their nose. Kids love doing all, all sorts of things. Is that a reason we should have it in the curriculum? So be careful of those um, kinds of emotions overtaking what you're doing. So teachers described students like using Minecraft, they were, had motivation, they relished the challenge, they were being on task, they're having to be torn from their activity, they were in the flow, eager to get stuck in, animated and excited, developing student voice and confidence. And that's all fantastic. That's absolutely what we need in, in our classrooms. But absolutely that is, in descri is describing engagement. Kids who are engaged. Uh, and not necessarily describing learning. Now engagement is a huge component. If you don't have engagement, you don't have learning. But engagement isn't where we want to stop. So even Minecraft, um, the, the heads of Minecraft describe this in terms of engagement. So transformative way to engage students or to keep student um, using it as a way of play and assignments to keep students engaged during remote learning. So we keep pushing the term engagement. Now that I've said that, listen to when you hear people describe using tools like Minecraft or VR or AR or mixed reality, um, and listen for how often people are simply describing kids who are engaged. And I, and, and I know engagement's a very complex thing. So it is behavioral, emotional, and cognitive. Um, but from where I'm sitting and from where Lisa and I um, came together, it's the first step. Getting kids to be engaged is exciting. And I know one of the people in the questions asked, is Minecraft just the technological Grecian urn? Something that's pretty and, fun and nice to look at, but really do does it serve an end goal? And that was a really great point. Thank you to whoever made that in the, in the questions on registration. And I'm hoping to show you that it's not. But we have to be very careful that we're not seduced by the technology 
or by engagement alone. Okay, so um, what I want to say is I want to give two little pieces of theory that I think are really important. I don't want to harbour um, on this. And if there are any questions as I'm going, Karen, happy to be interrupted. So the first one of these is uh, self-determination theory. And that's a really important component of why kids love Minecraft and why it is so engaging. So self-determination theory says, um, and this, this was um, Ryan and Desi, two researchers, motivation researchers, looked at and proposed that there are three core tenets of human, human motivation, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And that experiencing those leads us to have volition, motivation, and engagement. But if we do achieve volition, motivation, and engagement, that we then can start to foster enhanced performance, persistence, and creativity. So, you know, if we can set up one, we can create an experience of the next level and then result in the goals that we really want. Now, self-determination theory to me is critical um, in what kids why kids love Minecraft and why it's so engaging and why it's a great part of classroom learning. So if we look at the components, <coughs> competence is when we see students given an opportunity to demonstrate knowledge, skills and understandings and support demonstration of mastery of content and concepts. The autonomy comes when students engage, not just in selecting from bounded options. So often we say to kids, you can do this or that. Well, that's really a set of bounded options. But when they design authentic and creative paths and solutions, then they're making critical choices for themselves. And they can invest in their identity in their play. They can, more, more than ever, we see kids do far more than they were ever asked to do when they get, when they feel they have autonomy. <laughs> So, and then relatedness comes in the relationship between the learners and their relationship to, to the knowledge. So their relationship in terms of citizenship, mentoring, leadership, collegial support. Um, and a lot of what is powerful about Minecraft doesn't necessarily, and powerful particularly for the curriculum, doesn't necessarily just happen in the game. It happens in what surrounds the game. It happens in the conversation the kids have about what they're doing in the game. It happens in the reflections that they make about their experience in the game. And so this is what makes Minecraft appealing to our learners. Somebody needs to mute their microphone. I think it might be Colin. Is it Colin? Yep, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so, um, and then a, a term I like to use is looking at the affordances of Minecraft. So it's a big word for just what are the action, realizable, what are the perceived action possibilities? So how a teacher perceives Minecraft describes the possibilities it could have. Um, and I don't want to go into um, hum, um, human computer interface design, but just to know that Minecraft has certain affordances for bringing kids together, for creating a social space, a design space. Um, and those things are critical to certain parts of learning. So I also want to bring in another theorist that I think is really important. So Desi and Ryan are self-determination theory, but I want to introduce you to Liz Kolb. Now she's from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and she's a uh, associate professor in educational technology. And she's written two books that I highly recommend to ICTE New South Wales. Um, and that's Learning First, Technology Second, and then Learning First, Technology Second in Practice. And both of those books are replete with case studies of how to make the curriculum drive your use of technology and to ensure that you don't let the te technology seduce you. So unfortunately, I see some teachers who say, well, I've got Minecraft. And their thinking is, well, I've got Minecraft. Where can I stuff it in the curriculum? And that's really the absolute wrong way to go. 
the curriculum has to drive your tool use and your perceive your perception of the affordances of that tool should be why you bring it into the curriculum. And Liz's work is exciting um, in that she's looked at a number of technologies, not just games and gaming, all kinds of different technologies, and then case studied teachers who've created really transformative learning using that technology and still maintained a strong focus for the curriculum and the learning that they were aiming for. So if we look at her Triple E framework, and I know a lot of you will know SAMA, but when you look at SAMA, SAMA talks about changing the task. Has the task changed in a certain way? Um, you know, and, and looking at the, well, it's not a ladder, the different levels of how the task can be reshaped or reinvented um, in the learning. Well, in Liz Kolb's Triple E framework, she's looking at how the technology works for the learning goals. So does it engage in learning goals? Does it enhance the learning goals? And does it extend the learning goals? So her focus isn't on the tool or the task, but on always on the learning goals. And to me, this, the ways Minecraft can, can answer these three E's is why Minecraft appeals to a lot of educators. So where um, self-determination theory is why it appeals to kids, the Triple E framework should be why it appeals to you. And if we move on, so if we're looking at this, this level of it, engage, and, and I've spent a bit of time already talking about engagement, does the technology allow you to focus on the task or activity distraction, as in time on task? And, and I think we already know that happens a lot with Minecraft. Kids are very engaged, they're into task. Um, teachers don't have to pull them back onto task. Does it motivate the students to start the learning process? Absolutely. And does it cause a shift in the behavior of students where they move from passive to active social learners? And I see a lot of experience of that. But then I don't know, again, that's the engagement level. That to me is the floor. And now we're moving up towards enhancement. And the enhancement and extension of the learning goals is where I think we need to be pushing any immersive technology that we're using in the curriculum. So does it aid students in developing a more sophisticated understanding of the content? So can they demonstrate a more sophisticated understanding because they've engaged in Minecraft? Does it create scaffolds to make it easier to understand concepts or ideas? So does actually engaging in the immersive space make it easier to understand a concept? Does it create paths for students to demonstrate their understanding of the learning goals in a way they couldn't with traditional tools? Now, let me give you an example of that that I thought was just mind blowing. Quite recently, um, I've been working with um, Victorian schools on a, a 25 school project with Minecraft and the teachers are designing their own curriculum using Minecraft. And one of the, one of the teachers had given kids, this was while they were in remote learning, had given the kids, they were doing Anzac Day, and had given the kids uh, a research project to do on Gallipoli, and then asked them to share back their learning in whatever way was comfortable for them. And she gave them options so they could do a presentation, they could use Minecraft, they could do a flip grid, whatever they, uh, of a selection of tools. And one of, the, one of the girls did, she built the beach head, at Gallipoli. And with the build, the kids had a rubric to complete and a reflection task at the end to summarize their learning. And one of the students, this student wrote, having, um, having built the beachhead at Minecraft, I now know what an enormous task it was for our soldiers to have to scale those cliffs. So building the scaled version of the beachhead gave this child a really immersed sense of what that task was, to get up those cliffs um, and to fight the battle. 
And that, that kind of aha from a student really brings history to life. That's an intimate understanding that child had of the battle that she didn't get from reading it or, or from watching a video. So to me, that's what enhancement is, is that student had come to a much more sophisticated understanding of the enormity of what happened at Gallipoli. And then extension is, does the technology create opportunities for students to learn outside of their typical school day? Does the technology encourage them to do that? Can it create a bridge between school learning and everyday life experiences? And does it allow the students to build skills that they can then use in their everyday lives? And I hope to show in some further examples down the track a little bit of how that works. Um, do we need to stop for any questions? I lost my second screen, so I can't see all the questions now. Uh, Helen, is, have you, is there any questions? Are we good? There's nothing in the um, chat there, Karen. Yeah. Uh, just before you go on, Bron, um, yep. I'm just going to make um, Brian a co-host. I'm just going to pause the recording now. All yours, Bron. Thank you, Nate. So, so I, I, I really love, and Lisa and I, Lisa in America and I have been working with this AAA framework and have been working on a way for teachers to design their curriculum and implement technology in that curriculum in a way that pushes up towards extending the learning goals. Um, so I'd encourage you to go have a look at Liz Kolb's work um, if you want to buy her book. Her second book is just being launched at ISTE Online um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and they're both available like in Kindle version, so you don't have to get a paperback. And the Triple E Framework website's fantastic. As, as I say, she does a lot of case study work, so it's really great reading. You'll find someone who's teaching in an area akin to where at the, the curriculum you're teaching, um, even though her work is mostly in the United States, but you will find um, people who are teaching your, your aspects of the curriculum. So for me, um, the, the immersive in affordance of Minecraft are uh, that autonomy, competence, relatedness of social determination theory, and then the engagement, enhancement, and extension are curricular affordances of Minecraft. So that's the possibility, that's the actionable um, possibility. All right, so then I've, we've been working on an instrument to help teachers program mine, for use of technology. Now, it could be any technologies you'll see when we go through it. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, Minecraft. It, any immersive technology will actually fit in this space, um, in this tool. And it's a five-step model, stepping up to instruction in the middle and then back on the other side. Um, and I want to spend a couple of minutes just to take you through this. I've been using this with teachers in Victoria and um, other groups of teachers, um, and we've introduced it to some in-service programs um, to get teachers to make sure that their learning goals remain uppermost in their use of technology. Now, what I found with a number of the teachers that I was case studying, they started out with learning goals in history or math or science, and they implemented Minecraft or VR or whatever it was they were going to use. And then when I came to assessing at the end and I asked them about the contribution of those tools in the curriculum, um, again, they didn't talk about that, their the contribution to the curriculum, they talked about engagement. Um, it's the fallback position, but it isn't enough. And I know from the questions that were asked um, on registration, there's some skepticism about Minecraft just being fun or play. Um, and does it really serve the needs of the curriculum? And it absolutely does. And I'm certainly not going to say that you can't serve the needs of curriculum and have fun at the same time. In another, other presentations I've given, I talk about the four keys to fun. Um, and fun isn't necessarily um, 
it, it's not the dichotomy of fun and serious. Um, you can be doing very serious things and having fun. Um, so I don't want people to see having fun as being an antithesis, antithesis to learning. So the learning goals have to be the starting point. It has to be what's my curriculum in learning intentions? What are my outcomes? What is it that I'm wanting to do when I'm doing my curriculum planning? And from that, you might then say, okay, of the tools I have available to me, what affordances of those could serve my curriculum learning intentions, my learning goals? So whether that's, um, as I say, we've been looking at immersive environments, so that's virtual worlds, virtual reality, augmented, mixed um, reality, and massively multiplayer online games. And so what are the affordances of that particular thing that could serve my curriculum goals? So if someone wants to give us a topic, let's see if we can walk through and brainstorm some ideas along this road. If someone wants to put a topic in the chat, and we'll pick, that, pick a topic up and see if we can work our way through how we could look at the affordances of Minecraft. Rocks and minerals, invasion of Australia by the British. Yes, keep them coming. How about building a sustainable community, the solar system, Roman history, coding. All of the above. Designing an eco-lodge. Ooh, that sounds interesting. British colonisation. Driverless cars. Cool. Chance, basic programming. SDG. Designing a zoo. Circuits. Aeronautics. Wow, juicy. Lots of juicy, juicy topics there. <laughs> Data. Yeah. They're just coming through. Tiny houses and sustainability networks, coding again, fake news. Fake news, that's a really good one too. Yeah, All right, I'm going to pick up the sustainability, housing and sustainability topic. Um, it just coincidentally fits with a slide that I already had prepared, but um, I'll go with that because it's one I can readily run with. But all of those topics are very juicy and we could run, we could have run with any of them. I'm thinking on the driverless cars, we'd need some coding on that, that level for driverless cars, but I think we could really manage that um, at, at the coding level. But if we pick sustainability um, and housing design, and we knew what our learning intentions were, for whatever year that is, what it, that could be what, year eight? of the curriculum it can be used from year year six onwards um bron okay um all right so the affordance that we have of minecraft is um the the capability to create a virtual community so we can create a virtual society a virtual city and we can have students having researched uh sustainability demonstrate their understanding in that virtual space so the creativity of minecraft could be very valuable um, we could have them working in groups in that so the sociability of minecraft and the capability for them to work in teams could be really important um, Other affordances of Minecraft, I think the fact that students can be working away from school. So they could be doing this from anywhere, remotely, at home, different parts of the school, but still coming together in the same world to work on their project. Um, they could be building different versions of the same thing. So they could be building their sustainable home in different media um, to compare uh, the costing and the sustainability um, as they build it. And they could also be the capability of Minecraft to mesh in with other technologies um, is really quite exciting. So if I'm going to jump out of the presentation for a sec and just take you to a slide that will help us understand what we want to do. Oh, it doesn't want to get out. I have to, do I have to stop sharing to get out? 
Hold on. Yeah, you'll have to stop sharing. Yeah, I have to. Unless you're sharing your whole desktop. Yeah. No, it's further on in the presentation, and I should be able to exit, but it doesn't want to let me exit. Oh yeah, if it's in your. Oh, I'll go down anyway. This way, it's this one will do. So if we go back, um, so this is um, Andrew Balzer in New South Wales. Um, and this was a, I'm thinking a year eight project that he was working on. Um, and they had to take on the design and development of homes with a view to selling them and giving them a presence in the physical world. Um, now, that can be a real, Realization of sustainability to build those you can build um, a demonstration home site so you can create a site a world that has all of their demo homes that they've designed and that can unpack all the sustainability features that they've included in the home and how they've worked those through um, not just with Minecraft but you have the capacity to use signage um, posters books, other resources that are part of Minecraft to outline the sustainability features that have been included in the homes. And that's really quite exciting. But what Andrew did that actually I, I thought was really fascinating, he asked the kids then pitch the sale of their home. So they had to attempt to sell their home um, on its features. Um, and so if we go to the next, oh, no, it's not in. Is it in this slide? Um, I may not have included it. Um, what he did was he used um, Microsoft Mixed Reality. And rather than having to pitch using Minecraft, the kids were able to take their models of their home out and to put them into Mixed Reality and place them on the table in the classroom. And so the students could stand up and do their pitch with their item in mixed reality in the room. And that was really quite exciting. They could turn it, people could turn it around, look at it, examine it. Um, if it were in Minecraft, you could equally have walked through it as, a, as a, a player in the world. So in terms of being able to realize um, what they were doing and what they'd studied, this is kind of um, the gold standard. What I like about this is, it's very evident when you're listening to the kids designing in the world, whether they're engaging in the language and concepts of the field they're studying. You know, as you walk around, you'll hear them using the terms that you need them to understand, the concepts you want them to understand. And I'm a huge believer in the use of reflection and reflective tools to get kids to unpack what it is they're doing. But you know you've reached the gold standard of learning with Minecraft when your kids are not talking about Minecraft. They're talking about demo homes and the sustainability attributes of their home and why it should be the one people would choose to buy. So they're not talking about blocks and bits and parts of Minecraft. They're, they're talking about sustainability issues. So that kind of means uh, to me is what uh, floats my boat in terms of seeing Minecraft and the affordances of Minecraft for design. In that case, it's design that's one of the key affordances. And the sociability because the kids were working in teams, they weren't limited to being in the classroom. So there's a whole lot there. But the, the next step is probably the most influential of all of the steps. Um, and that's the instructional strategy. So how the teacher frames the immersive technology in the classroom determines how effective it is. So if you just say to kids, okay, let's use Minecraft and build in it, that's far less effective than saying, let's build a demonstration home village where all the buyers will be coming wanting to determine the most sustainable home. They'll want to know about the sustainability issues that have been considered in building this home. And they'll be rating the homes by their sustainability. At the end of it, you as the home developer will be giving a pitch to your company um, and determining um, which of the features will be the most saleable for your home. 
So you can see right from the beginning, the kids are immersed in creating a company, creating a name for their company um, that, that relates to the sustainability issues. They're going to do a load of research about uh, sustainability and what would be attractive to people. They're gonna to have to keep the cost down. So there's probably a budget the teachers framed for it. So they can't build a sustainable house where the budget is out the wazoo and no one could afford it. Um, so there's a whole lot of framing there that the teacher does in the instructional strategy. And that's the key. That's where you as a professional educator impact the use of this technology. The technology is not taking you for a ride, you're making it serve the needs of your learning goals. And so when you've taken your, your learning goals, you've selected a, the tools and it might be a mixture of tools. So in the case of Andrew, he was using mixed reality and Minecraft. Um, then you're looking at the instructional strategy that frames all that. What kind of role play experience, story, back, backstory, what are you creating for the students that will frame that use of the technology in their learning? And then you wanna look at how is that instructional strategy pushing the tool to beyond engagement? So how are you using it in ways that are enhancing and extending the learning goals? And, and you have to be looking along the way that this is actually happening. So when Lisa was doing some of her research on uh, VR in America, teachers were saying um, things like, um, well, we took the kids to Paris and they were so immersed in the experience doing it in virtual reality or whatever. And then she interviewed the kids afterwards and said, well, what was it like? And they said, well, it was really fun, but we don't know why we were doing it. So making that explicit link to the curriculum is important, not just for you as a teacher, but for the kids. If they don't get it, then they're not transferring their knowledge um, and the learning that they're doing in the space. So that's a really important um, thing that we assume because they're engaged, they're learning. No, they're not, they're just engaged. We have to go beyond that. And then there's evidence gathering and I, have lent towards, I've stopped using the term assessment largely and tried to use the term evidence gathering because it implies a multifaceted way of gathering evidence about learning. So it's not evidence about, um, you know, how sexy Minecraft is or how sexy VR is. It's evidence of actual learning that took place during the use of this technology and what part did this technology play in, in that learning? So for instance, that child who built Gallipoli, it was very obvious by her reflection, the role that Minecraft played for her in giving her an intimate experience of what the battlefield of Gallipoli must have been like. So um, the technology gives us Immersive technology gives us lots of opportunity for evidence gathering and that's um, we're looking at formative evidence um, and some summative um, has a, I would put a caution there because you build something in Minecraft. The build that you created shouldn't be the whole of your evidence of learning because uh, you know builds and images of builds be so-so, but the student articulating what they built is where the evidence lies. So the student describing um, what, they, what it is they've built or describing the sustainability features of their home is far more important than how good the build looks or how extensive the build is. But the fact that the student can use the language of the field of sustainability to explain what it is they've done in a way that's meaningful. And so to that end, I find another affordance of Minecraft that is not used as much as it could be is the actual camera in, in Minecraft. So you can take a screenshot from within Minecraft and then output it um, to a portfolio where you can caption it. And you can then take those captioned images and put them into 
a log with reflections. So students can output them and put them into Microsoft Word and write a reflection on what it was they were doing. Now, the reason that's a pretty powerful affordance of Minecraft is at that point, students are choosing their own point of assessment. So they're saying, um, or they take a screen capture or something they worked for a long time on or a challenge they overcame or something they're extremely proud of in terms of the knowledge of the field and output it and write the reflection on why this is important, why what they've learnt or understood here is important. And that student engaged assessment is very powerful. So student engaged and student articulated assessment is very important. And so reflection to me is a great tool um, as, and so is you know, observation for teachers to go around and observe the students working, to listen to them, to talk to them and, and look at how, how much they're engaging with the knowledge that you're wanting them to learn. So can I stop there and ask if there are any questions about this five step model? Nothing Looks like everyone's pretty quiet there, Bron. Yeah. Or bored. I don't know which. <laughs> but I'm finding, I'm, finding, I'm finding this instrument's a really great tool for brainstorming as a team. So a team, if it's a stage or a year level of teachers getting together or a subject and saying, okay, so we've got the topic coming up of um, fake news. Let's think about what are our learning goals? and brainstorm that. What are the learning goals that we want to meet? Okay, then of the tools we've got, what, what affordances do we have of those tools that would help further those learning goals? There's a lot of reflection in the chat. Um, a lot of people really like the, the model and the five-step approach. Um, there has been a couple of questions about recording. We are recording the session and we will share the link um, in a few days time via our social media and email um, and, and YouTube and our YouTube, YouTube channel yeah. and the PDF of the presentation will be available too so okay so we'll share all of that too there was a question around how can it be used in physical education I'm guessing My, the five-step model the five-step model or Minecraft on Andres, do you want to just clarify um, if your question was around the five-step model or Minecraft? Um, nothing just yet. Here we go. Both. Andres has said both. Um, okay. Well, in terms of physical education, you know, you have options for the design of um, physical spaces or of um, places of... Um, relaxation, places for fitness, places, playgrounds, all of those are options that can be designed in Minecraft as, and, and worked upon. Um, and I know in different groups that have built cities where they've designed um, in different teams. So where one team was responsible for um, community facilities, one team was responsible for residential facilities, one team was responsible for recreational facilities, um, and the kids had to research what would be, and that'd be a fantastic one to do after COVID because I've never seen so many people walk their dogs um, as they do today or walk with their family or ride bikes with their kids. Um, and so I think our, our bicycle tracks are woefully um, under accounted for in a, in a new, uh, much more physically aware community. Um, so that's something that, that can be done, um, those sorts of activities. Um, you, you hit me on the spot there, but I'll keep thinking while I talk and I'll come back to it if there's more. Sorry. But in terms of the five-step model, it's how you frame it. Um, we have a task in a mini Melbourne where we ask the kids to take the mini Melbourne map, which I'll show you in a minute, and design a new cycle way that will be safe for children. And so while well, there is a cycle way in Melbourne, it's very close to a lot of quite dense traffic. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the tasks to look at the needs of um, Mini Melbourne um, in, 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 of fitness and health. Um, we also had in, in that sustainability realm in Mini Melbourne, we asked kids to look at the greening of urban societies 
and to consider how you could take some aspect of Melbourne and green it. Um, and so students research greening urban environments. They look at the ratio around the world of cities of um, green to um, built up in, in the city and look at Melbourne and estimate what they think is the, um, the green capacity of Melbourne and then look at how they could create better greening with what's there. So creating rooftop gardens and um, you know, green walls and all sorts of other attributes. So you know, there's lots of cool ways there that can relate to health and physical education. So go ahead. Ron, about are there, so Paul wanted to know, are there any sample programs available for high school students? As in, I'm not quite sure what you mean by sample programs, but let me go on and maybe I'll have the answer in a coming upcoming slide. No worries, thanks, Ron. So evidence gathering needs to be of learning gain, gains, but also Minecraft's role in the, in the learning. So we have to be multi-dimensional um, and we have to make engagement the floor, not the ceiling. Don't, we can be excited that the kids are engaged, but then push through that to go to enhanced and extended learning. Now, I'm just gonna to jump to a slide that might answer that question. Um, this is resource that already exists um, in Australia. The first one is um, Minecraft with activities. I think in that one, there's like 85 different activities across the national curriculum. Um, with a background on um, using it in the curriculum. And on the right is one that was specific developed, specifically developed for the Victorian curriculum, um, but doesn't mean you couldn't use it if you're in New South Wales. Um, and it looks at the seven areas of the Victorian curriculum. But all of these look at learning from around, um, I think we start with year three um, through to nine and 10. And we're constantly building up more resource for that. Um, so, you know, there is a lot in this and there are a lot of educators around the world who are mentioned here. So for instance, if you were teaching languages and you wanted to look at what's the gold standard in using Minecraft in languages, then you might look at Glenn Irvine in the United States because he's done some amazing work in teaching Spanish um, and some fantastic creative and innovative ideas. Um, so, we, the, the resource is not just lessons, but it's ideas and it's educators you can follow. Their, their uh, Twitter handles and their contact details are in the Australian document for you to go find them. Uh, you can track them down. And so we cover very many areas of the curriculum, but we try to do it in a way that has visionary activities, not just, oh, here's, an, here's another way to do it. Because if you can do it on paper, and do it well, I wouldn't be using Minecraft. But if I look at some of the things I used to teach when I was in the primary classroom, I knew there were things that I wasn't reaching the kids. I wasn't, they weren't getting the knowledge in the way that I was hoping they would. And so that's where I would start to think about in, in, appropriating um, virtual technologies into the classroom and particularly Minecraft. So these two resources are specifically designed for the Australian curriculum. And so, um, as I said, the links, uh, you'll get the PDF of this, so you'll be able to get the resources um, easily online. And there is a whole section on the minecrafteducation.net website devoted to Australian resources and Australian ideas. If I just, just go back to the five-step plan for a sec, I just wanted to finish a point there, which was, um, what we're finding is this is a great tool for brainstorming as a team. So picking an area of learning, looking at the affordances of the tools you've got at hand, um, and then, and, and it could be any tools you've got. Um, as, a, as I said, it can't be, we've got Minecraft, can we stuff it into our curriculum on fake news? You know, it's what, is, what does Minecraft have that might be useful for us if we're studying fake news? It may not, and you might rule it out and choose a different way to go. Um, but what we're thinking is, and I've seen this used, is brainstorm all the ideas, go crazy, get as many ideas down as you can, and then um, edit it back 
to what can become a, co a cohesive lesson or a cohesive unit of work. But when you start with your goals and you know the affordances, you must be able to decide your evidence gathering and be sure that you haven't allowed the tool to seduce you into thinking engagement is enough. So the editing is really important. Brainstorm, get down all the ideas of the team and then pull back and say, yeah, well, for a first time round, maybe that's not doable. Or, you know, that might be asking too much in the three weeks that we've got. Or, you know, so you edit it back um, like a fashion designer might, create their dream fashion thing and then edit it back to what's um, going to really meet the needs of what they want to do. So this is a, turning out to be a great little tool for that planning stage. Okay, and so this is a scenario that I can demonstrate that with. This is Ashley, um, who teaches in Ipswich Central in Queensland. One of the case studies that I've done of about 15 teachers now. Um, and she was doing a really interesting unit on spoken procedures not really one of the most exciting topics in the curriculum. Um, I think in this case, she was teaching year four. And, um, and often kids do uh, give a spoken procedure for making a Vegemite sandwich or give a, a spoken procedure for um, getting dressed in the morning, which to kids is kind of nonsensical because if you know how to make a Vegemite sandwich, why are you giving a the procedure to somebody else. So, you know, in this case, what she got the kids to do, they had just studied Charlotte's Web and they were then um, looking at writing, uh, speaking, uh, spoken procedures, written and spoken procedures. And the place that you find the most spoken procedures is on YouTube. And if you ask any year four student what they want to be when they're an adult, they want to be a famous YouTuber. Um, um, and the bad news is they probably all won't be, but they're enamored of the subject. So what she did was took the Charlotte's Web and made a segue between the literature they just studied and YouTube that the kids love, where you see a lot of spoken procedures, and asked the kids in Minecraft to build a story scene from Charlotte's Web. And they had to decide what was pivotal from the story. There was a lot of language work went into it from their language and literature. And then they built the scene. And then they created the procedure as a YouTuber on how you could build what they built and stepped someone through how to build that and videoed it. And so she provided them with access to school friendly YouTubers. And there was a lot of research they did on spoken procedures, but you can understand how a this was motivating. Yes, but it went beyond motivation because they were assessed on their, on their procedure on how well they performed, you know, how animated, how interesting, et cetera, et cetera, because they had determined by watching YouTubers, what makes a good YouTuber, what makes a good procedure. What makes it work, you know, being animated, speaking well, speaking clearly, uh, engaging your audience and so on. And so when they came to doing this, they had developed their own criteria for what was going to be a good piece of work. So exciting stuff. Um, and so when we look at deconstructing Ashley's scenario, and this is not an example I wrote, this is a group of teachers I did the deconstruction with. Um, and so they were looking at, they, they were, had heard her story and they were then looking at deconstructing it using the five-step model. So this is a great way not only to build up a lesson, but to look at a really good lesson and deconstruct it. And so um, I'm not going to go through all of this because it's um, quite, uh, quite detailed in some respects. But you can see there was a lot of um, evidence gathering they had from the scenario um, that it wasn't just do this and take a test at the end. And that's one of the things that uh, Lisa found with VR in these states and I found here, there's sometimes a mismatch between the immersion of the task and the assessment strategy. Um, 
in that you've done this immersive engaging experience and then you use a very standard assessment. Well, you may have to use the standard assessment at the end for a number of reasons, but along the way, you should be doing observation, reflection, discussion, um, you know, all of these other aspects, getting the kids to design a rubric of their own for what makes a good oral procedure. Um, and then the kids assessing themselves against it. Um, not all of that is created, as I said, by Minecraft, that is created by a professional teacher employing Minecraft to enhance and extend the learning that she wanted to do. So how much more engaging and interesting is that for kids to develop than a procedure on how to write a, make a Vegemite sandwich or get dressed in the morning? So, um, yeah. So the, the, this document is available and, it, and, and all the links to this will be in the, um, in the PDF that Karen can let everybody have. And that's the address of where you can get it anyway online. Um, are there any questions if I stop there for a sec? Got any questions for Ryan or Helen that we've... No, nothing so far in the chat um, chat room or the chat box. Um, any questions? Just pop it into the chat and I'll... Um... Or if you want to take the mic and ask a question, this is a good point to pause for a little bit and say... Yeah, okay. Andre's got some, a question on assessment. Do yes. You elaborate on that a little bit. Do you mean how can you use Minecraft for assessment? Yes. So assessment, how can we use Minecraft for assessment? Well, it depends what the topic was. Um, in the case of Ashley's work, the oral procedure is their, is their demonstration of their understanding of an oral procedure. So their YouTube video they make for themselves on how they built their Charlotte's Web world is, is their assessment. Um, if students are building um, their sustainable house, then what's gone into that sustainable house, their reflections on their considerations for sustainability, the pitch they give on selling their sustainable house, um, all of those things are components of assessment. So to me, what the kids do in the world should embody the research they've done. So, um, you know, if they're working on a unit where you've traveled to another planet to develop um, humans on another planet, then you, how they set that up will, will demonstrate what they understand of um, life on other planets, what we need to have. Um, so what you're looking for is have they immersed themselves? I would be looking for the language. Have they immersed themselves in the language of the field? They should be demonstrating the language required. And that language should be related to the concepts that they were working on in that space. Um, you know, there's current missions, current units of work where you can become an astronaut on the NASA, on the International Space Station. There are, and I'll come into that in a minute, on the different designs of learning spaces. Um, so there are lots of ways that the assessment can be carried out depending on what your learning goals were in the first place. Yeah, the so the, what they do in the space should demonstrate their understandings, um, knowledge, skills and understandings um, in relation to the topic. And if you walk around and your kids are talking about the topic, not about Minecraft, then you know they're, they're engaging with the content because that's one of the things Liz Kolb cautions against. Often when we think we see kids engaged, are they engaging with the tool or are they engaging with the knowledge? And that's a really good um, step to question when you're watching your kids working. Um, in the case of Andrew's kids, they were talking about building they were, um, and, and homes and saleable points and you know, being a real estate agent they weren't talking about the technology of Minecraft. So you wanna to look to make sure they're engaging uh, with the knowledge through Minecraft, but not just engaging with Minecraft. 
unless Minecraft is your point of learning. Any other questions? I think, Bron, that that's the same with any tool that we're using with in the digital tech space is, um, you know, once you've got, you've introduced that tool and the kids have, have tinkered with it and all those words that we describe tinker time, it's, it's about what's the learning. It's not about the tool. The, the, the tools to serve us as teachers and how we want to meet our learning goals, not the other way around. Absolutely. And that's why that the top step in the five step model is the teacher framing. How you frame it is, ha is what makes it important um, and, and, and makes the focus stay on the content knowledge. So Minecraft itself comes in, in many forms. And for some people, some of these are more appealing than others. So um, learn a design world to where you have an open, open field and you say to the kids, here's the, here's the task or challenge. Here's the piece of project based learning I want you to engage with. And they're going to design the whole thing. And what I've put here is the links to three exemplar lessons in that area. So the dinosaur design is one. Rube Goldberg machines is a really interesting one because that's a programming uh, context. And Minecraft music video, again, um, using uh, Minecraft as a part of a backdrop to, to music, creating music. These are all worlds and challenges that you offer the students and they answer that challenge with Minecraft, in Minecraft. Um, and so going in, the teacher will set the challenge. These are lessons all currently online that you can access. Um, but the, the students will, you set the challenge, you might set the rubric, and when you do so, you'll be setting what assessment you want to, to use to ensure the lesson goals, the curriculum goals have been met. Then there's externally designed world templates. And um, there are a few really good ones of those where some other someone else has designed the lesson um, and offer perhaps the lesson and the world um, for you to download and use, but you're designing the task inside that. And so um, there's a number of different ones uh, that are quite nice. Build a Better Bedroom was a really good one to do um, during the COVID isolation period because it was um, build a better bedroom that allows that that allows for your physical and mental well-being. And so you had to build a better bedroom that allowed for you to exercise in a way that's personal to you. So, you know, if you're a footy player, that might look different to if you're, um, you know, a, a cyclist or so on. And so that build a better ch bedroom challenge the students had to justify their build in relation to their personal fitness and what would make a good bedroom for them. Um, research Stations Antarctica is developed by um, the Australian Research Station and you can go to Antarctica and carry out a, your own research project, but within ooh, sharing paused. I don't know why it paused my sharing. Sorry. Yeah. What happened there? You have a, a blank screen on my end. Yeah, something happened. Can you reshare? Yeah, just, uh, no, it says stop sharing. I'll have to stop and restart. Um, let me just make sure I'm in. I think the actual presentation I, I was in crashed. Oh, no, there, there you go. There yeah, it's back. Okay. So, yeah, so, but, but you have to fit within the Antarctic rules. And one of those that's kind of be tricky for Minecrafters is you can't mine in Antarctica. Um, it's not permitted. And then there's Mini Melbourne. Now, Mini Melbourne is, um, if you don't know, is a, is a build of Melbourne. The CBD, it's not all of Melbourne, but it's the central CBD of Melbourne. Um, it was built by the Department of Education and the Department of Roads and Tunnels. And um, it has two projects within it, but, um, and a lot of suggested activities, but it's not pre-programmed 
lesson. It's a build of Melbourne. You can get on a tram and travel around Melbourne. You can walk Melbourne. You can uh, search, swim in the, in the Yarra and search for dolphins, which, by the way, do appear in the Yarra from time to time. Um, so you can explore Melbourne and, and the Department of Education has proposed a whole lot of teaching ideas that could go around this build. Now, the reason this is a powerful build is because it's a one-to-one -one of the C, this part of the CBD. Um, and it's, it looks authentic. When you're standing outside Flinders Street Station, you will recognise it. And so the landmarks of Melbourne are very um, easy to recognise. Um, people are using it, um, were using it, uh, pre-urban um, excursions or urban camp uh, in Melbourne. And so using it to acquaint themselves with Melbourne. So there's a lot of attendant activities um, with that project, but the teacher chooses how to, how to use that. The so world has been built. There's a question about that one, yeah. um, about the fuse.education.victoria um, page. Do you mm -hmm. need logins to be able to access that? Or can no. You, no. So you can no. go to that link and access yeah. that. Fabulous. Thank you. Not as far as I know, the fuse is a public part of the Victorian education site. There's a second project attached to that, which is more, more game-like, which is more actually bounded in that you go into one of the tunnels as an archaeologist. Now, that was designed because in the, in, when they were digging the tunnels for the new uh, railway, they discovered all this archaeological material and they had to stop and catalogue it and... And, and do things with it. And they thought, well, wow, this could be really useful if we could use the affordances to Minecraft to recreate this space, we could have the kids come in and be the archeologists. And so you can go into the Archaeology Melbourne project and dig for items. You then take them back to the laboratory and try to identify what they are and research what the context might be for them in terms of the history of Melbourne or that part of Melbourne. So there's a really fascinating thing that you find, and this is all based on what they really found in the tunnel. Um, and if you dig too hard, you break the artifacts. So you have to be, you know, you have to take on some level of behaving as an archeological practitioner. But there's an interesting one you find in one spot in the tunnel, you find huge numbers of teeth. And, um, you know, that's kind of weird. Why would you find loads of teeth here? Well, of course, you, you don't know their teeth yet. You identify them as teeth. And then you go back and research what was in that spot in Melbourne um, 60, 80, 100 years ago. And you determine that it was a dentist in that block and what he did apparently was he would pull teeth and throw them out the window and so there was this there's this collection of teeth in this particular part of the archaeological dig. so it's very cool very fun but um and this is um cost a lot of money to build because it of the level of authenticity and design that went into it but the uses of it for learning are outstanding so that's an externally designed template or world. And then there are pre-packaged worlds that you can use where both the world and the learning adventure have already been designed. And one of those that I particularly love is the world of Verona. So this is, for those of you who teach English, this is um, about writing a persuasive argument, but it's um, based on Romeo and Juliet, but it's the world of Verona after Romeo and Juliet died. So you go and interview the Montagues and the Capulets to determine um, some aspect of, of what happened. And you interview agents in the Minecraft world who are either Montagues or Capulets who have vested interests in some cases um, to find out what happened. You gather evidence by talking, talking to those characters in the world. And then you come out and you write your persuasive argument to answer the question you've been given and cite the evidence that you've recorded. Now that's the kind of world you could build for fake news. 
you could build an enormously fun and exciting world on fake news for kids to walk around and interview people or read, read you know, news items or whatever else, and then have them reason or argue for what was, what, how they've researched them and what could and may not have been fake news. So World of Verona is fantastic. Pre-designed, you walk in and you follow instructions through the play. Um, one that's available that I would recommend everyone look at who's teaching kids above, I want to say year five or six, but it's designed for 13 year, old, year olds, is The Mindful Night. Now, it was released in February and it's a social emotional learning pre-designed world in Minecraft where you go through and you learn mindfulness exercises. Um, we, we got teachers um, using it in the remote period, playing it as a family. So kids at home, learning at home, played it as a family with their parents. Um, so that the younger ones could engage with the learning without having to do as much of the higher level reading that was required. But that's a really nice one you go through. It's been designed by an educator, um, in the, a person in the social emotional network. And those working in SEL in Australia have praised it as being a good intro to mindfulness. And then there's, as I said, the Mine, Minecraft Mini, Mel, Mini Melbourne Archaeology Adventure, which is you get to be an archaeologist. That's a pre-designed game space where you travel through the game um, and you're learning along the way. So these are probably the three basic spaces that you'll find for Minecraft. Um, but there is one I want to add that I think it is, is very exciting to me. Um, and that's what Mini Melbourne looks like. Um, we've already looked at Andrew Balzer. That's what the world of Verona looks like. So the agent speaks to you um, about the Montagues and the Capulets and you travel through the world. Um, but I want to talk about coding because I know a group of you asked about that. And, you know, there's lots of fun coding lessons on the system. I've been, I worked on one series we're looking at called How Did They Do It? Where we see an animation build something in Minecraft and you then have to deconstruct it and code it yourself. So you have to replicate what you see in the animated build by creating your own piece of code. Um, and that's sort of deconstructing something. So for instance, you see the agent build a pyramid and you then have to go, okay, well, what do we need to be able to tell what coding do we need for the agent to be able to build a pyramid um, in the way that it's done? But I want to give a shout out to this particular video and Stephen Reed um, and a number of people in education at the moment who are doing live problem solving with coding. And I think this is a really exciting space where in the particular video I've linked here, um, Stephen has done a series with his company, Immersive Minds, where he does live sessions on Twitch. Um, and if for those of you who don't know Twitch, it's where you can watch something and comment and, and you can have dialogue with the presenters while they're presenting or doing. And in this case, Stephen had a series, if you go to the Immersive Minds site, you'll see there's a series on renewable resources. And I've watched all of these. They're fantastic. But what he did in this particular session was he was programming, he wanted to build a way to create um, wave energy in Minecraft, to code wave energy, so that you could create waves on a beach, which don't exist in Minecraft, and then use the waves on the beach to create some energy that could then be transmitted via a circuit to power something in the world. And so this is live problem solving. And why this is exciting is you can have one team actually doing the code, pulling the bits in to code it, but you can also have um, a whole class giving them ideas on what to do, on how, what to do next. And so if you watch this particular video with, which Stephen's doing, um, he's taking ideas from the audience on, oh, did you try doing this? 
um, because there was a problem in which he could get the tide to come in, but it wasn't going out or it was coming in and going out, but not repeating. Um, and so he's trying to replicate a real world thing in inside the blockiness of Minecraft. And the coding in this and the problem solving with the coding gives kids a really good insight into the power of coding and how there's not one answer to solve a problem. Um, answers can be more or less elegant, but there are different ways to go. And that it's in an iterative process in order to reach the solution that you're trying to, to the problem that you're trying to solve. So this was very cool. And you'll see from the code builder in Minecraft, which is um, built into Minecraft now, Minecraft Education Edition, that you could also be doing this in JavaScript or Python. So it's not just block coding. Um, you do have options of um, going in different directions or swapping mid-direction to have a look at under the hood at what the blocks are doing. But I would recommend those of you, a number of you asked about where can you be taking this with coding? Um, it's realizable. They can see, they can test it iteratively and see what the agent does building in the world, what it's creating in the world. Um, and Stephen's series on renewable energy, he looks at wind energy and, and um, as I said, wave energy um, in a number of these live coding sessions. But what I love about this is the actual. It's the thinking live with an audience. I can imagine kids at school absolutely relishing this as a project to be able to have one team do the coding and have taking their advice from others in the audience um, and, and being able to do this live thinking um, on the spot. So that's another, bit, another way of using Minecraft that, um, that is really quite exciting. Um, that's Andrew's, I wanted to say Andrew's house building. I, I, the slide must have dropped out into the wrong place. And there you'll see the kids with the uh, mixed reality version and they were selling uh, their model, sustainable farm model, um, to their audience of possible house buyers. Um, and that, that app smashing Minecraft with other things, I think is also a space that's really exciting. Um, Karen and I were in a session recently where uh, Megan Towns from Microsoft shared SharePoint Spaces, which is in trial at the moment, but allows you to bring 3D objects into a SharePoint space. So they can be Minecraft objects or objects from other tools and bring them into one space and create um, um, really exciting environments. So, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. And I'm happy to take any questions. Feel free to pop questions into the chat or just un unmute yourself and um, feel ask Ron. I think somebody should make a Sydney version of the Melbourne one. That would be very uh, yeah it's very it was very expensive no one's ever told me the budget but I have a feeling it was big um, and that's why it wasn't just the Department of Education but the nice thing is you kids can take the world and build the next piece of it that hasn't been built it gives them a standard also a high level standard of authenticity so that it's not just um, little blocky things, you know, they can be building something that's recognizably um, the Opera House or the Titanic or any number of um, you know, environments. But if I look at the questions people sent before the session, maybe that will help. Um, I think I had kept them up, yeah. Um, I'll pop the feedback form into the chat. So if you can you fill that in before you do leave the session because we will be emailing the resources to unknown caller. So um, one of the questions was how can you incorporate Minecraft in the year seven or nine geography curriculum? Geography is replete with fantastic examples of how you can incorporate Minecraft in a way that's very meaningful and useful. Um, and in fact, one is one of the best sites, um, one of the best sets of 
lessons on the Minecraft site um, relate to geography because you can use things like Google Earth data to recreate an actual space, a literal space um, or, and the topography of a space you have to take it through another program and then back into Minecraft, but you can take the topography of a place and then build on it. Um, you know, you could take Google Earth data for um, the parts of the Great Ocean Road or uh, for Sydney Cove. So there are, um, you know, ways to pull that in, in terms of that sort of geography. Ron, um, Helen has asked, are there any coding resources that you can recommend for, for um, coding in Minecraft? Yeah, they're in, the, in Minecraft itself, um, if you pull up, there's a coding world. It has a whole lot of intro coding. It depends on what age of coders you're looking at. The intro coding and the hour of code resources for Minecraft are great for um, beginning coding. And then online, as I said, there are a growing number of um, coding and computational thinking resources developing. Um, and as the, the, the work of people like, I'll give you some names, Stephen, Steve Isaacs has done some great work on beginning coding, so has some YouTube videos on that. Um, he's Mr. Underscore Isaacs on Twitter. Um, Stephen Reed, as I said, from Immersive Minds has, if you're looking at more senior coders, he has some really great activities um, on coding and using coding in Minecraft. Um, as I said, it's a growing space. Um, and at the moment, um, it's, it's kind of a burgeoning area that I'm pretty sure if you ask that question in six months, I'd have many more things to point you towards. The tutorials are really a good place to start, I found. I actually have a book called Coding with Minecraft by Al Swigart, um, and that does a lot of like text coding in there. So that would probably be quite good for stage five. Um, yeah, I mean, the the coding, the coding world, if you open that, has a whole lot of step through, you know, um, that gets you to, the, I think the first thing you do is code it to rain chickens, yeah. um, which is very funny and everyone loves to do. Um, I have some videos of where I've worked through some of this with teachers on the intro level um, in primary school. Um, and if anybody's interested, I can point you to the URLs for those. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot more in the more senior area. And, and we haven't put up our lessons on how did they do it yet, which is getting kids to look at a, a, an animated build in Minecraft and then deconstruct it and write code um, iteratively to replicate it. Um, and those are a lot of fun, the challenges that we're working around that. Ron, there's a question in the chat about how do you get the information from Google Earth into Minecraft? Is there a tutorial or a video um, for that? There isn't, but um, Lynn Telfer um, in Victoria has done it. And if you want to look up Lynn and ask her about it, I know a couple of Victorian teachers that I'm currently working with are trying to are doing it. But it does involve taking the Google Earth data through another program or at least one other program, and then bringing it into Minecraft. Yep. So it's a bit of it's a bit tricky, but it's very doable. Um, but if you want to ask, send me a, send me an email and ask me. I'll make sure to point you to the resource or Lynn or whatever to help you with that. Yeah. Um, someone asked about teaching with python um, as you you can see in the in make code you have the option of going block python or javascript so you have options in your coding um, sustainable biomes someone asked about absolutely brilliant for teaching biomes are um, already downloadable so you can choose biomes in um, which biome you want to use for your world um, so someone asked they wanted to do geography um, in stage four and five um, for year nine, where they're studying sustainable biomes in term three. And that's absolutely doable and very interesting to do. Um, is Minecraft best for a club or a project time to avoid being a waste of time? 
and how to stop students downloading in class. Well, I don't think anything the kids do in Minecraft is necessarily a waste of time, but it's driven by the teacher. If you're, if they're focused on a task or problem solving or project based learning or whatever, then, you know, they're working towards uh, a goal. And that's, that's really where you want to start. But a number of schools that haven't already done much with Minecraft have found starting a club is a great way to start just to see what the kids can do with it. Because part of the limitation to this is us, is our lack of imagination on what the kids could be doing. Um, and so if you have a club where you're less restrained by the curriculum, you can let the kids um, have at it. One of the P P P professional development projects I have is where it's a two hour professional learning thing for teachers where we get you to do a little bit of the tutorial and and then we ask you to take one of 10 30 minute challenges back to your class and ask the kids to do the challenges one of them and um and then walk around and talk to the kids while they're doing it and watch what they do just observe the kids um, let them talk freely share their knowledge have a look see what they accomplished and then at the end of the lesson Say to the kids, okay, if we'd had Minecraft last term, what could we have used it for? And start to hear from the kids what they could have imagined they could have done with it. And you'll start to open up a lot more ideas for yourself. Because um, for us, because we're not, this is not the world we were born into, um, and it, it is for them. But on that, the, the flip side of that is, one of the teachers who ran, who won the, the first Eratropolis build for Minecraft, and if you don't know about that, that's where you, you, um, Liverpool City Council invited schools to, to design the Eratropolis to surround the Badger East Creeks Airport um, in Minecraft. And the winning school won $10,000. And the teacher, Daniel Radcliffe, Dan, not Daniel Radcliffe, Daniel, who won it, um, said to me, you know, I was a Minecrafter as a teenager. So that's where we're at with Minecraft in, in the history of things. But he said, you know, I didn't realise how it could be employed in the curriculum until I became a teacher. I had no idea of the kind of knowledge I could be developing with it. So that's where you as a professional educator impact the natural ability of the kids. You're the curriculum master and they might be the play or the build master. But it's good to ask them and say, what could we have done with this last term? If we'd have had it last term when we were studying this and this and this, how could we have used it? Um, I've recently used Minecraft for junior engineering and seven coding. Um, I'm used to it as a formal task. I need to be able to set projects and be able to assess their learning at the moment. They're sort of just playing around. Okay, well, I mean, that, that really comes down to challenge design. Um, what are you asking them to design and how are they articulating their knowledge? So it's not just the build. Um, the build could be something that looks like nothing, but when they articulate what it is that's incorporated in their build, you may actually hit all the points of your rubric. Um, I'm a fan of rubrics. I'm a, fine, a fan of reflection. I'm a fan of... Um, observation, you know, there are so many ways to come at this um, to ensure the children are engaging with the knowledge. So what is the evidence of that? We want to see them using the language. We see, we want to see them employing the concepts. Um, you know, all of that is what we need to challenge them for, not just look at the build. Too often in Minecraft, we share a picture of a build and it's kind of meaningless, really. It's a picture of something, but what you need is the description and the articulation that sits behind that um, to understand if it was powerful learning or not. Ron um, Alana, yeah, I'm sorry. Bron Alana has a, um, a comment in the chat and a question. She's looking at running a two day STEM day using Minecraft as a tool um, and looking for any suggestions from anyone um, of what the theme might be is what I'm guessing from her. So Alana, if you want to jump in. She's looking at mindful night, not, not start again. Mindful night could be a possibility, but are there any other suggestions? Um, this it's year seven run 
group run by the technology teachers and the whole thing has to end in a presentation. Those yeah. um, sustainable houses would be another one as well. Yeah, I also like the idea of the um, looking at coding, you know, looking at the water and that sort of thing, because the students have actually touched on housing. Um, or sorry, they will in eight, but I mean, just trying to make it real world to us is really important. Um, so mm -hmm. if we can introduce something that the kids, it's beyond what they normally get in their classes, but something which is quite relevant to them, but they also have the fun with it as well. Um, like the idea too of having a group that suggests some problems and then the other groups have to solve it or maybe breaking them up into different areas, like you say, the engineers and the designers and the, but just wonder yeah. about any yeah. other ideas. Yeah. Is this a STEM, two day STEM challenge for teachers or for kids? Of course, for kids, but That's basically fabulous. the teachers supporting them. But you, I'm looking at the time frame. You've only got two days. So mm -hmm. basically you come in, you probably do a presentation at the beginning and then let them go away in their groups. So probably about six to eight groups, 144 students. Um, we've also got access to laser cutters and 3D printers, but just thinking of the time involved. Yeah. I like the idea that Minecraft, they can all get it onto their laptops and you have that flexibility, maybe. And yeah. what year? Uh, year seven. Seven. Yeah, I, I think the coding could be a fantastic one to do. Um, a theme like renewable energy or um, powering a city or I don't know, something where they're using coding and the interactivity like the redstone and, and, and circuitry of Minecraft. Um, but yeah, that, that wow, that would be exciting. Mm -hmm. The other way, as you said, you could do social emotional learning but I don't know if there's enough in that for two days. Yes, yes. What about the, um, somebody already commented on, you know, uh, your bedroom, you know, had you had to redesign your bedroom during COVID. I mean, mm -hmm. that could still be something relevant for the students having gone through that. Yes. Um, and being at home. With a lot of them, it was their study space and where they slept at the same time. And that was interesting to see the impact it had on them. Yeah, well, I, certainly one that I know the teachers love doing with the kids um, and we got the teachers to do it as well as a homework task and they love doing it themselves, you know, so um, yeah, so it, that's a nice one. It does, it's more design and build. It doesn't, it less involves coding. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think for a two day STEM day challenge, STEM challenge, I'd want to set the bar to something that requires a team mm -hmm. um, that is, you know, like, a little bit beyond so they have to really stretch themselves yes because if you say to kids build a roller coaster in minecraft they don't go well i don't know how to do that they go to youtube they research it they google it and within half an hour they'll have 10 different ideas to start with on how to do something so i'd set the bar a little harder than you might otherwise um, well, it could, the other idea could be like a leisure park, but it has to rain, uh, be on sustainable energy. Or well, they've got to look at some way to power those rides and activities. Yeah. Yeah. My kids did a roller coaster in about 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> mm. But if you do that to adults, they go, I, 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 I don't know how to make a roller coaster. <laughs> or I can put a cart on tracks, but, you, but how am I going to power that? And yeah. Whereas kids don't, they, they will, they know where to find answers to what they need. Well, maybe I suppose looking at a um, geological location, you know, somewhere it has water power, solar power and, you know, uh, giving them a location and then they have to create it and, and power it. Yeah. Well, you could build a world that has all that, that has water and, you know, hills for wind and whatever else. And, mm and then have them consider um, you know, a proposal for renewable energy um, in that environment and then give them some parameters for it that it has to fit into um, you know, and, and set that as a challenge. Do you think, um, for, or anybody experienced with Minecraft, do you think if you gave them a day to build the world and it has to have certain things in it and then the next day you tell them that they actually have to create things within that world you know that's where the renewable energy comes in so it could be the 
the building, a, you know, build a house or something like that, or a leisure park. So they yeah. could have different locations. You know, one group could be on the beach, one group's in the mountains. But yeah. they want to build their environment, then they have to build into it in the second day. Yeah, I think that could be great. The other way that reason that's good is because in the first day is a much simpler thing. Kids mm. who haven't had experience with Minecraft will be able to get their chops, you know, in that first day. Um, and then everybody's pretty much on the same page in the second day. Mm. And would, you, would you suggest that the 144 all have Minecraft on their computers and then they can co collaborate, you know, as a certain group of 24? Or how do you suggest managing that? Well, 144, you can't put in one world anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, do you want them to have a joint world work as a team in a joint world hmm. um so you may have a team of five or six working in a world together or however many you want it, it just depends on the task the challenge that you set hmm. or how you want them to go yeah i was going to ask um at my school i've got the uh, free version uh, i'm not sure is that because of covid or because um, I think online it says you have to pay, but my whole school's got it for free. Well, Minecraft Education Edition was made free because of COVID, but I, but New South Wales schools de do have licences um, or, or have access to licences. So, yeah, I, I can't speak to that, but I know they made it free for six months and they'll review that at the end of the six months. Okay, yeah, no, because they've all got it, but... <coughs> Yeah, with I, thought, I thought it was free to all DET schools in New South Wales, but all the independent schools had to pay for it and the CEOs. I think we have to pay, so, but we've got it for free now. I, I don't know if it is free to all New South Wales DET schools. I think a certain number of licences were purchased oh, okay. and then schools applied for their licences. I know it's free to all Victorian schools because a license was purchased for every student. Yeah, and so when you joined the world, I think maybe um, I was trying to set it up so you can, as a host, I can set up the whole thing so they come in and then... Yes, absolutely. You can set up a world and have, you can have up to 30 but really it's optimal at about 20 students in one world. Okay, cool. And if the teacher initiates the world and then gives the students the join code, then they can get in. Um, but as soon as you close it down, their access is closed as well. Ah, oh, yeah, I've had it, yeah, okay. <laughs> so we have some good, I have some good resources I can share with people on running um, multiplayer worlds and running remotely. If you, if we need to go back to that, um, how to include kids who are not on site, um, you know, uh, in what's happening. Is that something we can uh, share with the PDF from? Yeah, sure. Were there, um, I'm just looking at any other questions. Um, are there any explicit examples of measurable gains in student learning using Minecraft in seven and eight technology? Well, it depends, I suppose, what you want to call measurable. Um, you know, what is your standard assessment in, and, you know, if you're employing Minecraft, should you should look to see learning gains how are you assessing that so measurable is a, a bit of a fluffy term to me if you want to get you know kids to do a test um some interesting things happened in virtual worlds work that i've done in the past um we, we looked at kids that learnt about deforestation in a virtual world and kids who learnt about deforestation um, in a, a really credible, good resource with a classroom teacher online. And we looked at their results at the end with a test to see what their understanding was of the issues of deforestation. And they were probably comparable. But the kids also wrote an essay about deforestation. And the kids who learnt in the virtual world 
their, the quality of their understanding was out the wazoo. So, uh, for instance, like that kid who wrote, I now understand what the soldiers at Gallipoli had to overcome to climb the cliffs um, to fight the battle. It was that quality of understanding that, does, that doesn't come across in a test in terms of their understanding of history or knowledge or math or science or whatever it is. Um, and the other thing we found was the kids who learnt in the virtual world about deforestation, they felt they had been in a forest, that they had visited a forest and they cared about it. And so if we're looking to create learners who not only have the knowledge, but have the empathy and the caring about the world in the future, you know, these are things we can access by taking up the affordances of Minecraft if we do it, you know, in a way that's um, challenging, exciting and, and inviting for them. So um, measurable results. Um, one of my projects at the moment is to get more teachers to share their assessment and to share their stories of assessment because the rest of the teachers won't come to using this technology and, and unless they see there's a real, um, there are real gains. And so we have to access that. It's upon us to do a little more action research with our teaching when we're pulling in immersive worlds into our teaching. Um, and so we can produce results that we can share with our colleagues. And it can't just be, um, as I experienced with a lot of early Minecraft, we did this and the kids loved it. Because that doesn't cut up with your peers who are skeptical about using a tool. Um, you know, it, it needs to say, you know, well, when I taught this last year without Minecraft, we had all these difficulties. And this year when I've taught it, you know, we're finding these really interesting things with the kids being able to engage with um, the concepts. So. Yeah, I know that's probably not the answer um, that you wanted about measurable gains, but I think it's up to us right now to be producing the evidence or not, because my, the answer to every learning context is not Minecraft. It doesn't fit as the best tool for everything, um, but there are places that it fits really beautifully. And I must say on the minecrafteducation.net site, there are a lot of lessons that were developed by your colleagues. Teachers in New South Wales, teachers in Victoria, teachers in Queensland, um, Minecraft mentors, global mentors in Australia. Um, there are lessons that not all those lessons were developed by um, people in the USA. A lot of them um, were developed by um, colleagues here in Australia um, and have an Australian bent to them. And, and that space is growing with more and more lessons over time. Well, Bron, thank you very much for your time and um, the way you've led us today. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, can I also thank everyone who's already filled out the feedback form? It is really helpful for us um, on the board to be able to have that feedback because it, it means the way that um, we create and, and um, develop these webinars improves every time we, we do it. So um, thank you for those who have filled it out. If you haven't filled it out already, can you, I'll um, share the link again um, now. Karen, would you like to um, yeah, say anything before we finish? Uh, the last thing I had to say was um, along the lines that we would like your support. Um, I said it very early in the piece today for a second form that we will put together and, and send out to everybody that has attended our webinars on A, what future topics you might like and um, what time and what day they might be suitable once term three goes back and all our extracurricular things are thrown back into the mix of our afternoons and um, we don't want to, ACA have been running uh, webinars as well and we'd like to be doing some things in partnership with them and a number of other organisations as well. I've already spoken to Bron and, and she's offered to come back next term and, and do some more work with us as well. So if you'd like to put in the feedback form of what you would like um, from Bron as far as um, where Minecraft may or may not take you um, or the how-tos and uh, we'll add those PDFs as well. So yeah, so thank you to those people that have already at the beginning of this chat added their um, ideas about times and, and when. All of our 
webinars are recorded. They are up on our YouTube channel and I might just get you, Brian, since you're the holder of the keys of that to yep. explain what we do with all of our stuff. Yeah, basically um, all the videos are archived on our YouTube ch channel. Um, they are also archived on the back end of the, the members only section of the um, website. Um, basically uh, for each week after we do our presentation for about seven days after the webinar, it is also posted on the free webinars section on the website. So there are three ways you can um, get access to the, the replay of the video. If you want the resources um, that go along with the presentation, they will be living um, just from a structural perspective. They uh, live on the website um, in the members section. But as far as I'm aware, um, they will be also emailed out to you. Yes, if you participated in the or signed up for the webinar, they are emailed out um, as long. Yes, so that that's also fine for those people that aren't members. But Bron, thank you heaps for joining us this afternoon and doing such an awesome job. Um, one of my favourite catchphrases from um, Simul Papert is is about having hard fun. Yeah. And uh, it's one of my mantras. And um, but with that 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 fun comes the learning, and the learning is what's most important with what we do. So. I love the fact that Minecraft can do that. I have no skills in Minecraft, but I use it in my classroom and my kids outbuild me and I don't even try to keep up. It's, it's about show me what you can do. And um, because I do it with stage two as well as stage three, um, it's about the kids tutoring each other as far as the skills in the how to's in Minecraft. And then we, we get on with the learning after a couple of weeks and, been very successful um, and what excites me about it is that the kids go beyond the play beyond the tinkering and um, you have some really meaningful great learning conversations with children about what they've done so so thank yeah. you I've put my contact details in the chat so if anyone has a question or wants to follow up with something that's specifically trying to do but you make a great point Karen you don't have to know how to do all this yourself you just have to throw the challenge out to the kids and see where they take it. Um, you know, if you, as I said, you have a look at some of the fabulous lessons on the minecraft.net site, there's some really imaginative things happening across the board in subjects um, and kids are doing um, great work, um, but great curriculum work, not mm. just great Minecraft work. It's not we do Minecraft. It's we do science, we do math, we do history, we do geography, and we employ Minecraft. Yep, I agree. Thanks for having me anyway. And thanks everyone well, for coming along. Yes, thank you everyone. Thank you. And um, I'm going to stop the recording. Hi, Brian. Bye, Brian. <laughs>